from Wayne State University in 1985. And then he went away to prove that he can be smart uh, in the Midwest and in the East, and he got a PhD in clinical and health psychology from the University of Florida in 1990. And uh, like a faithful person, he came right back to Wayne State University and uh, served us for 28 years. And I saw him rise through the ranks to become uh, an associate professor, a full professor, and now he is a distinguished professor. And I'm delighted that uh, he's here. There's, there's the not much space between distinguished and extinguished. <laughs> <laughs> And you can see he's a relatively young man, so he's not going to be extinguished for a while. So thank you very much. Uh, along with his doctoral students and colleagues, he has developed and tested various uh, emotion-focused psychological interventions, particularly related to emotional disclosure and emotional awareness and expression. He has been funded by the NIH for many years and has published over 150 peer-reviewed articles as a, uh, as a cynical, a clinical psychologist. <laughs> person trips over that word. <laughs> Dr. Lumley enjoys teaching psychotherapy as well as training and supervising students in clinical practice. During his years at Wayne State University, he has mentored 39 doctoral students to the PhD and has received both local and national awards for excellence in mentoring. He's on the editorial board of numerous journals in health psychology and uh, psychosomatic medicine, and is, and is a fellow of the American Psychological Association and Society of Behavioral Medicine, and has been the executive on the executive committee of the American Psychosomatic Society, uh, the Society of Health and Psychology, and the Council for University Directors of Clinical Psychology. Uh, he has been um, the recipient of numerous very big grants. And I could mention uh, one grant that, uh, that just, uh, just finished a grant for one million four hundred and thirty-eight thousand uh, dollars. He was a co-investigator for a study entitled uh, "Effects of THC on Retention of Memory for Fear Extinction uh, Learning and PTSD," funded by the National Institute of Mental Health. Um, he has a current grant that, is, that, that comes to an end in 2020 uh, for the relatively modest uh, sum of $381,808. Uh, he is part of a group of scholars who uh, is studying development and preliminary testing of no novel virtual human assisted psychosocial interviews for patients with chronic uh, musculoskeletal pain. And uh, he is a <coughs> co-investigator of, of a grant from the Ethel and James Flynn Foundation, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, came, came to an end in 2017, totaling $200,000. Uh, and uh, that uh, study was on psychological treatment for people with chronic pain and mood and anxiety disorders. And of course, he is very, very well published. You would expect that of a distinguished professor. Um, I'll just mention a few of his most recent publications. So he has a piece on psychological therapy for centralized pain, an integrative assessment and treatment model published in uh, Psychosomatic Medicine in 2019. Uh, he has a piece entitled uh, Systematic Review of the Effectiveness, Effectiveness of Psychological Treatment for IBS in Gastroenterological Settings, Promising but in Need of Future Study. 
Uh, this was published along with six, six other colleagues in the, uh, the, uh, the gist for science, science digest. And then um, this was in this this was in 2018. I just mentioned one more, uh, which he did with seven other colleagues. Um, ambivalence over emotional uh, expression and perceived social constraints as moderators of relaxation treatment and emotional awareness and expression of training expression training for irritable bulbar syndrome. It was published in General Hospital Psychiatry in 2018. And I can go on and on and on uh, about the wonderful publications that he has made. Today he will talk to us on emotional awareness and expression therapy for chronic pain conditions. And so I welcome to the podium distinguished professor Mark Dunn. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Appreciate that. <laughs> Goodness. Um, Would you like a podium? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm a stander and a wanderer <laughs> to give the photographer, the videographer, some challenges. Um, I, was, I was listening to this introduction and reflecting on the number of numbers that were presented. Did you hear the numbers in there? 150, X number of dollars, X number of questions. We should be focused on numbers a lot, right? And I actually think that we should probably do the field some good by trying to figure out what kind of impact people have rather than the number of publications they have or dollars they generate. I've been thinking about that. The older I get in my career, the sort of less concerned I am about numbers and the more concerned I am about making change in the world. And I hope to kind of present some of that today. Um, thank you all for coming here. I, I appreciate your sociology instructor. You said you were great. <laughs> 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 Aww. And the rest of you, good to see some colleagues I haven't seen for a while. Joe Fitzgerald, welcome, welcome back from newly retired status, soon to be emeritus status. Um, so I'm going to do sort of an interactive thing a little bit, ask some questions. This is a very diverse group, right? You come from all sorts of different fields. Uh, I'm used to talking, uh, tomorrow I'm down in Athens, Ohio, speaking with a large group of pain practitioners. So two very different audiences, folks here from sociology and English and all, sort of, all sorts of different departments. So I'll see if I can make this as relevant as possible to the humanities and to the breadth of interests in this room. But if somebody said, hey, I got a chronic pain problem, or your loved one does, and they said, let's go to see a psychologist or other practitioner, any idea what sort of therapy might be recommended? Anything you've heard about in the literature or in the field? Well, you get that, is what you get. <laughs> chronic pain <laughs> therapy, it wins prizes. And recently, there's a lot of talk, a lot of chatter about acceptance and commitment therapy called ACT or various other mindfulness-based approaches, but most of the people in my field, if you have chronic pain, they're working with people according to one of these two models. And if you look at something like CBT for chronic pain, the, the overarching goal is to teach people skills to manage their pain. I underline those two words because they're both sort of important. These are the sorts of skills that are taught. I'm not gonna spend much time here. But they're basically ways to decrease arousal, you know, improve focus, decrease the sort of negative thoughts you have, increase activity, and improve one's mood, solve like problems in your life. Um, but the larger goal is, we'll teach people some skills to manage their pain. If we ask this question, how effective is this? This is the question that's been driving me a lot lately. Because if you look at lists of, of empirically supported treatments or evidence-based practices, you'll see a list of things that work. You know, that our field loves to say, this is effective, that's effective. I suspect the same thing is true in various other fields. This works, this doesn't work, you know. And the list of what works gets longer and longer. And then you're left with, which do I choose from this long list? I've been asking this question, which is, how effective is CBT? And um, a, a meta-analysis, a copy review from just a few years ago, said that the Cohen's D effect size is four-tenths of a standard deviation improvement in pain, for example, from before treatment to after treatment. And if you do an experiment and you compare treatment like CBT with just nothing, then you get about a two tenths of a D value of two tenths of a standard deviation. But how many of you speak D? Joe speaks D. No other speaker? Okay. Let me turn this into something that's plain language. If a patient says, hey, um, how much will my pain improve if I have <coughs> cognitive behavioral therapy rather than my usual care? And the clinician would say, well, Mrs. Jones, Mr. Smith, on a zero to 10 scale, the average patient's pain improves about blank number of points, more after having CBT than after having your usual care. 
give me a number that you think fills in the blank. Two, Two points. Other numbers. Three points. Do I hear four points? <laughs> <laughs> One. One point. We're in the right direction now. Half a point. Two tenths of a standard deviation. A quarter of a standard deviation is not very much on a zero defense scale. The average patient pain improves in these clinical trials about a half a point. If you look at other outcomes like their mood, their depression, how well they're functioning, still less than a point. I don't know that I actually want to celebrate this. Matter of fact, I don't. And if I'm a patient, as some of you are, you're thinking, I want more, I want a better outcome, I want a greater, I want the most powerful treatment I can have that I can handle. It doesn't have too many effects, side effects and the like. Um, so I've asked myself, and by the way, this is the gold standard in my field. It's been studied dozens and dozens of times, it's recommended widely, but its effects are actually pretty small. Why is that? Well, one option is one, you know, some of my colleagues have said, well, these randomized clinical trials sort of minimize the effects. If you take really good practitioners and patients who really need it, um, then you're going to get large effects. That may be partly true. But actually, um, there's other things that have been raised. One option, by the way, is that we simply have reached the limits of our effectiveness with our treatments. We've been experimenting, trying different things. This is as much as we can change it. Maybe that's because uh, pain itself is largely not connected with psychological processes. In which case, we shouldn't expect a psychological intervention to do much better. But I think there's a lot of other reasons. And I'm going to just share briefly five, and then for the rest of my talk, focus on two of these five. But the five reasons that I think the mainstream approaches have missed the boat are the idea that all pain is the same. Pain is pain. Doesn't matter where it comes from. Doesn't matter if you've got rheumatoid arthritis or neuropathic pain or sciatica or, or fibromyalgia or headaches. It's just we have to treat it the same way. That's a, that's a belief in my field that's very common. But actually, pain and people with pain are quite heterogeneous. Here's another concern. The models basically say that chronic pain starts in your body somewhere, and it sends signals up your spinal cord up to your brain. And it's fundamentally some sort of a nerve problem that your brain might have some capacity to up or down regulate. But it turns out there's a very, very weak link between anything you can find on imaging, like problems in the spinal column, for example, and people's reports of pain. Matter of fact, around this table, if we were to run all of you through an fMRI and take a look at your backbone, for those of us who are over 50, or over 52 like Joe is, um, <laughs> Walter here, uh, you'd actually find probably 80% of our backbones would have anomalies there that could give rise to pain, even if we don't have any pain. I mean, the presence of anomalies on fMRI are really high in pain-free people makes for a very low correlation between what you find on scans and what people report. That's a problem. Um, here's another problem. The idea that the brain, the only thing it can do is up or down modulate how much pain is coming in from the body. That's true, but it can go more than that because the brain can actually generate and potentially eliminate pain. And then the two points I want to get to in a little more detail. Most of my colleagues, if you ask them about patients' background traumas, psychological traumas, or psychological conflicts, they'll say, don't need to go there. It might even be harmful to go there. Let's teach them skills to manage or deal with their pain or just move forward in life. But let's not go backwards and deal with that stuff. But these are things that we know drive and maintain pain. And then finally, what do we think about negative emotions? Right now, most of my colleagues say, these are unfortunate byproducts of living with pain. And by the way, those of you who live with pain know that you can indeed become depressed and fearful and angry and everything else, of course. But is it also the case that instead of just trying to get rid of those things quickly, we can do some work with those negative emotions in a healthy, adaptive way? So I'm going to focus on these last two points in a little more detail. Here's an interesting slide that, uh, when I saw it about a decade ago, sort of woke me up. This Venn diagram shows overlapping conditions. If we start up here at the top, fibromyalgia, which I'll come back to, it's a widespread pain condition. Um, it tends to overlap with chronic fatigue syndrome, going clockwise, irritable bowel syndrome, tension type headaches, migraine headaches, temporal mandibular disorder, jaw, jaw pain if you like, Rest, uh, myofascial pain syndrome, even sleep conditions like restless leg syndrome, and periodic leg movements where your legs are kicking during sleep, multiple chemical sensitivity, bothered by smells for example. Um, Things connected with the reproductive system and the urogenital system, like dysmenorrhea, interstitial cystitis. And then this thing up here, you can't see it so well, this thing, but at 1030, PTSD, which stands for? Post traumatic stress disorder. What the heck is a psychiatric disorder doing up here with all these medical conditions? Well, we'll come back to that too. 
Turns out, if you ask patients, and that's what we do in our studies, we ask patients about their lives, we find a lot of histories. And so in the patients with these sort of conditions, here's a few brief stories. This uh, woman said, when I was 12, 14 years old, my drunk dad would come home and wail on my mom. And I just sat there frozen in the next room listening to it. Um, this woman said, when I was going to University X many years ago, I got in the front seat of a car for the guy to take me home, and he raped me. And when I went to the police station, they said, what were you doing in the car? You were full. And when I told my dad, he said, didn't I tell you not to? So com the rape is compounded by the subsequent rejection. In the car. And here's a really complicated one. This, this woman said, when I was a child, when I was 12, my brother, who was two years older than I, he had sex with me repeatedly. And then she went on to say, it's not rape because I let him, because I knew that our parents were so wicked, so evil, that the only way we could survive our childhood was to be a teen against them. Ouch, that's difficult, that's complicated. These are real stories. If you look at these sort of centralized, I'm calling them centralized, central nervous system conditions, like fibromyalgia and the rest that was in the Venn diagram, PTSD overlaps with them in terms of the number of patients. It's about a third. About a third of the patients with these conditions will qualify for the diagnosis of PTSD. But what about these patients? Three other patients. This 50-year-old woman said, when I was about 20, I yelled at my mother, shut up! And she got very angry with me. And to this day, I'm sort of terrified of her whenever I see her. And I don't use that S word anymore. It scares me. Or this, uh, this young man said, he's in his 30s now, he says, my father never did accept the fact that I'm gay. And every time I return home for the holidays, my pain just skyrockets. Or this man said, my daughter, who's in her 20s, uses heroin. And I'm just, I'm in such a conflict about it because I have to love her, don't I? I have to take care of her, don't I? I can't be mad at her, can I? Are these post-traumatic stress disorder sort of experiences? Probably not. They don't qualify for the life-threatening. I don't know what to call them, but I think what we might want to call them psychological conflict, to take us back to an old term. That things that, uh, that inter events in life interact with one's needs and one's emotions to create this struggle, and they're very common. Most patients who have these centralized pain conditions have either PTSD or, or more broadly, important psychological conflicts. But most of my colleagues in the world of pain psychology don't target these problems. They see negative emotions as a, as a problem. If you're anxious, you're angry, you're depressed, well, first off, that's a symptom of having pain. Or, well, by the way, it's positively correlated with pain. The more angry a person is, the more depressed they are, the more anxious, the more they have pain. So the goal should be, I mean, if you saw these sort of data, right, every study I look at shows that these states are correlated positively with pain experience. What do you want to do? Get what do you want to do? Get rid of them. Get rid of them. Yeah. And we need to reduce them, uh, manage them regulate these emotions, right? By the way, the, the term emotion regulation, I don't know if it's hot in other domains or other fields, but it's certainly hot in psychology. It really means control, manage, down, minimize. But there's a ton of theory and research in our field that suggests the opposite. That actually trying to reduce, minimize, eliminate, control negative emotions and negative thoughts is actually problematic. So I, some, I sometimes sit around driving the car or wherever just thinking of types of research or theories that support the idea that avoiding negative emotional experiences is maladaptive. So here's a few things that popped into my head in recent months. There's a whole literature on alexithymia, which is a term that means no words for feelings, for those of you who like neologisms or something, no lacking words for feelings, alexithymos. Um, that whole literature says, which I contributed to to some degree, that if you don't know what you're feeling, that's correlated with being unhealthy having pain, having other sort of problems. There's a literature on what maintains fear. If you've had a bad experience in life and you're still afraid, what maintains it is avoiding the thing that causes the fear, trying to not go back there. There's a literature on experiential avoidance by Stephen Hayes, who also, it's a, a broader idea that in general, what causes pathology, psychological pathology, is not experiencing things that you ought to experience. James Gross is a social psychologist who studies emotional suppression. What happens if you try not to show your feelings? Like if you're watching or experiencing something upsetting, you try to stoic it out, don't you want Physiology gets cranked up, your mind gets distracted, a number of negative effects of suppressing. Dan Wagner is another psychologist who says, try not to think about 
Try not to think about a white bear, for example. Go ahead, don't think about it. Put it on your mind. And a lot of other studies has done to show the consequences of trying not to think about are negative. Anita Kelly does work on lying when people have to tell a lie in some social setting. Um, Dale Larson on the notion of self-concealment, especially self-concealing things that are sort of stigmatized about yourself. Maybe it's sexual orientation, or maybe it's a disease you have, or something else, a legal issue. The notion of having to conceal that from others is harmful. Um, Jamie Pennebaker did work on non-disclosure, uh, of not writing or talking about the sort of things that, that bad things have happened to you. And finally, the folks who study emotional intelligence say the same sort of thing. All these literatures point in the same direction. It's not a healthy thing to not experience, not give voice to, not approach these difficult memories and feelings. That's what sort of drives me, this sort of model. Um, a little side note, I won't ask how many of you have ever had counseling or therapy. Hope you have, I have. But when I teach this stuff, and the question is, what makes for the best outcomes in therapy or counseling? If you observe a therapy session, or a bunch of sessions, what patients are gonna have the best outcomes? Historic, yeah, what do you think? Uh, it's sort of willing, uh, willing to take action. Yep, so it's a, it, willingness, openness is a key piece. Yeah, that's a key piece, that's important. The biggest predictor, by the way, often was thought to be if you can develop an alliance, a therapeutic alliance, or a working alliance between patient and clinician. It's always been thought of as the most, the strongest predictor. Recent meta-analyses suggest it's actually emotional expression and the effect size of the largest. Patients who express emotions during sessions have the best outcomes, and it's the biggest predictor of all. Um, it's fascinating to watch sessions of therapy. What I usually see when I watch a session or I listen to sessions, I do this a lot in our training program, is I hear two people in the room working hard not to get emotional. <laughs> it's almost like there's a collusion. The patient is like, oh, this is uncomfortable. The sensitive therapist goes, I can see this is uncomfortable. Maybe we'll digress a little bit and just chat or keep it light. I want to do something about that, as we'll see. I think about techniques that happen in the, co in the process of therapy, along a continuum, of how emotionally activating they are. And when it comes to working in the world of chronic pain, but actually in, with lots of problems, if you think about something that is at the end of the spectrum where it doesn't get you riled up at all, it actually might even quiet, can you think of a technique that somebody might teach you? Try to do X. To meditate. Meditate, that shows up. I'm gonna come back to that in a second. Relax, that's high on the list of here. Distract your mind. Distraction, bingo, I, I jumped the gun. <laughs> Distraction. Uh, that's probably the most common suggestion technique to really not activate emotions, just put yourself somewhere else followed by relaxation training, like you were saying, um, helping the person engage in pleasant activities, uh, having them do some cognitive reappraisal, think differently about this upsetting thing. By the way, I pushed these a little bit towards higher activation because to do reappraisal of a negative event, you sort of have to think about the negative event briefly with a negative thought before you change it. To do pleasant activities, you might need to tell somebody I would like to treat myself this afternoon. So spouse, so kids. No. No. And that's a little bit difficult. Saying no might be activating, right? So I like to think of these as sort of the cognitive behavioral emotional downregulation techniques. And then we have this whole left side of the, of the figure. What sits over there? What are techniques that we could use to help people actually activate emotions related to trauma or conflict? I'll give you a few. Uh, Doctor, go ahead. Thinking about the problems. Yes. Actually putting your mind towards it rather than away. Um, we might talk about that as a form of imaginal exposure. As a matter of fact, you could make it a little more vivid. In your mind, go back to that time and that place. Now allow it to play through. Don't run away from it and don't turn it off. Anything that might even be more activating than that? Uh, journaling. <laughs> Emotional disclosure. Various techniques to, to put it from in here out there. And it could be in writing, it could be verbally, but somehow to take the memories, the images, the ideas, the feelings, and give them some language. Anything more powerful than that? More activating than that? Uh, 
and revisiting the site. Revisiting the site? Yeah. Right on. I'm going to move it one space over. I'm going to stick one in the middle, and you're going to come to that. Experiential enactment is something I do a lot, and it's basically not only talk about it, but role play it out. So it would be sort of like this. Uh, Walter, I know that you've got this issue with your your colleague who's been driving you nuts, right? And instead of just talking about it, I'd like you to imagine that he is sitting right there. And I'd like you to be as honest as you can about all your feelings towards him. Whatever those feelings are, probably it's going to be anger. But if he's actually been close to this person, there might be fond feelings as well. It's an interesting picture. And I'd have him not just talk about it or share the feelings, but actually try to enact it. Maybe use his muscles in some way, as well as his words and his language. And then there might be something that's even more activating and more scary. And it might be called in vivo exposure. In vivo means in life, in real life. So this is where you might actually go to the place that happened, or more commonly, bring in the people involved into a session. Let's bring your mother in, the one that you told shut up to 30 years ago. True story. She said to me, I'm 50, my mom is 75, she still intimidates the hell out of me. I can't do it. You're still afraid of your mother at this all these years later? Yeah. What do you want to say to your mother? I want to say, shut up, but I just can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. We negotiated, we negotiated, a few weeks later, guess who was in? <laughs> Mom was one tough cook. She's like, what's my daughter's problem? And uh, <laughs> daughter was able to say, I want to tell you shut up, but I'm afraid of you. To which Mom said, why don't you quit being a wimp? <laughs> <laughs> because I'm afraid of you, you scare me. But I want to be able to tell you shut up. That's all it took, by the way, for this patient who's now 50 to have a tremendous decrease in her symptoms. The next week I saw her, how you doing? I'm so much better, I'm lighter. What's different? Did your mom change? No, she's still the same. But for the first time in years, when I went to her house, two blocks down the street, I didn't want to run away as fast as I could. I felt different inside of me. By the way, somebody mentioned mindfulness, meditation maybe. Where does that fit on this continuum? Emotional activation versus deactivation. Would it be relaxation training? Does it overlap with this thing a lot? Because it's sort of a relaxing state. Maybe so. Other ideas? It also could overlap with distraction. It could. It depends where your mind goes, I suppose, as you allow it to happen. Has anybody had it overlap with sort of experiences that come to them that are not so pleasant? Memories, emotions that they allow in. I actually think it actually fits over a large range. It can be, for some people, very activating. They'll have emotions and memories that they allow rather than fight against. But for other people, it's sort of like quieting. It's one of the reasons it's an interesting technique. It covers a lot of ground, but it also covers a lot of ground if it's hard to know what the heck it's doing. So here's a model I'm going to share with you. Let's see how we're doing on time here. I want to share with this model, which I've borrowed from some psychodynamic, psychoanalytic thinkers. Um, it's probably the leading model that still hangs around today. So this is, this is post-Freud. Okay? This is much more modern and contemporary work. But this triangle of conflict tries to capture the three important parts of we humans. Importantly, at its base, at its fulcrum right here, is a set of activating emotions. Think of these as healthy, adaptive needs, drives that we all have. And notice the top one that I've listed there underneath it, right? Anger. I'll put a star next to the ones I think are most central, the most commonly seen. Now, anger is one of these things that um, scares us, though. And we see lots of examples in our society where it gets out of control and causes damage. But most of the patients we see, actually most of us, have righteous, appropriate, healthy, adaptive anger. Have you ever been victimized in some way? Ever been treated unjustly? by virtue of who you are. Yeah, but you have. Good to see you. Come on in, Joyce. Anger is the normal, adaptive emotion in response to injustice or violation. We got it. And if you look at patient populations as we do, you'll see a lot of it, but it's often suppressed a lot. It's avoided a lot. But there's other important emotions. Sadness over the loss of something attached that you're attached to. Um, tenderness and love, especially to important family members, for example. Self-compassion, the ability to sort of feel good about yourself, to take care of yourself, are really key. The four big ones, I think. There's some others, the ability to experience true joy, 
and sexual desire. There's probably some others on the list too. But the ones we see most often are anger, and then sadness, love, and self-compassion as, as problems. They're, they're problems because people are often avoiding these things. And how do they avoid them? That's the upper left corner of the triangle. The language of defenses might work if you're psychodynamically inclined or avoiding strategies. But think about what people do to not experience or express their anger. Or their grief. If you introspect, you'll probably come up with some of your own strategies. We've got a lot, don't we? Avoid feeling anything. Turn it off in some way. Yeah. Yeah, use some substance to sort of medicate it away. Flip it around, I think, as positively as possible without going there. Could even be tricky ones, like, I've forgiven that person. But they really haven't. Maybe, but maybe they really haven't. Hard to know. Um, oftentimes it gets sort of transformed into something else, like just feeling defeated or, or blaming oneself. Hard to be angry with him. I should have, I should have, I should have. It's my pride. I, I, right? Anger is a scary one that we really defend against a lot. But it turns out you could defend against sadness. I see guys particularly good at this. Um, love and tenderness. The allowing oneself to actually be connected, to, to trust somebody. We're working with a client right now who's a master at being tough. She keeps people at a great distance. And she says, I want a guy in my life who's got no feelings and no needs whatsoever. <laughs> um, and she's talking about how she keeps everything at a distance. And what she really needs to do is develop a capacity for love and tenderness. To be able to say, help me. I love you. I need you. What she's really good at is saying, screw you. And then self-compassion, another piece of being able to actually take care of oneself. What happens when people get these feelings activated is that they engage in defenses or avoidance strategies, and these things get activated. These are like inhibitory symptoms. All the things on the upper right are symptoms people experience that constrain them, that shut them down, that block them, that prevent them. I'm just anxious. I'm just stressed. I'm just bummed. And I'm just frustrated. I'm just embarrassed. I'm just in pain. And these are what people present with commonly to their physicians or their clinicians. They present with the things on the upper right. How do we, so if this model has any validity, what do you think we need to do to help people? How do we use this model to guide what we do to help people? Um, probably activity or... Some activities like, like activating or... A yeah, um, sometimes like but uh, when it comes down to even like emotions, anger and everything, you can do, I'm quite sure you can do, find some kind of activities to kind of like redirect. Yeah, but what if the person says, I don't want to deal with anger, I'd rather uh, avoid it. What you actually do in therapy is you start by preventing the avoidance. You ask, you invite, you encourage, you cajole, you bribe, you negotiate, not avoiding it. So, I don't want to see my parent. I don't want to think about that thought. I don't know, I talk about that. I like to smile instead. All these things are ways of avoiding feeling it's anger, for example. And the task is first to stop the avoidance, and then to activate, to encourage the experience of these things at the bottom. And the stuff on the right that they're complaining about in the first place, what you do is you sort of keep those in mind, because if you do too much of this work at the bottom, they might start to have a lot of these things up here. You know what happens when you ask people to actually activate their anger towards maybe injustice or violations of the past? Oftentimes these things start going up too. So you have to sort of negotiate and titrate how much, how intense you want to be. But this model sort of guides some of the thinking we've got. So let me give you a little truth in advertising. My colleagues and I basically said, let's come up with a therapy. That, that pulls together some stuff. And it turns out that most people, including yours truly, who claim that they develop new therapy, are actually um, borrowing and building upon prior ones. The truth is, we relabel, we repackage the pieces, we reapply it to a new problem, and we call it something different. Guilty. <laughs> um, in our case, we've plucked ideas, procedures, techniques from a whole bunch of other approaches in the field. I won't get into all these, but I will, will mention you know, things like rescripting therapy is, is 
acting out as a, in a play a new ending. The feelings that are not typically expressed because of the hurt that you've experienced to this person. Let's actually have you express those feelings now. A new ending, for example. Um, and so we had the question, what are we going to call this? Well, one thing that struck me is that we are nuts in our field, maybe other fields too, about TLAs. Have you ever noticed everybody starts to come up with another TLA? They're just like coming up with them all the time? You know what I'm talking about? No. <laughs> oh, I didn't define, sorry, sorry. Um, well, a TLA is an acronym, right? It's a, it's a three letter acronym. It's a three letter acronym. Four. It's a three letter acronym. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love watching the light bulb start to go on. <laughs> the light bulb still starts. <laughs> the only thing I've ever actually come up with in my own in my whole career is this. <laughs> but our field loves three letter acronyms to name therapies, right? It turns out I've been keeping track of them. <laughs> The list just goes on and on and on and on and on and on. And literally, every time I'm reading something, I grab another one and add it to the PowerPoint slide, you know? And it just goes on and on. It's just everything. We love those. In your fields, do you have a three letter acronym fantasy uh, mania? Yeah. So, psychotherapy certainly does. Um, I sometimes wonder will we ever stop inventing new therapies? Will we ever? Yeah. Um, Turns out we will. That's the limit of the number of therapies we can have in the field. Once we've reached 17,576 therapies, we are done. How right? many is it so far? Well, I only listed about uh, 90th there, but we could reach up to this number. Then we're done with therapies, right? And you know where this number came from, right? Uh, the different combinations of three letters? Yeah. How many ways can you count? <laughs> There's probably a few therapies out there that just won't get named, like the ASS therapy or something. Uh, but there's going to be a bunch of but, and so this is facetious a bit, but the truth is, it was on my mind. As we thought about what to name our therapy, I thought, I gotta Google something, so I came up with one, and I said, what about emotional exposure therapy? And I Googled it, and nobody else claimed it. <laughs> so we started to go, then I said, I just cannot drink that same Kool-Aid of all of my colleagues. And so I said, I gotta call it something different, and I went with a FLA, <laughs> if you like. So we called it this thing, Good to see you, Stephanie. Thank you. Sorry, I want to hear the end. I'm my boss. That's important. That's important. Um, so we actually named it this, and we started doing studies calling it this and publishing papers, and sure enough, it's got a reputation, and it's getting around as this. Um, we wrote a paper just read, just a few months ago, just kind of outlining what's going on with this emotional awareness and expression therapy. i got to be honest with you, though. I don't really want to have yet another therapy to add to the long list and have people compete for therapeutic space. I really hope that people, including this audience, will take with you the idea of certain principles or ideas or components of things, or the principles of change, rather than just got to learn another therapy. But it's got some basic components. We start with telling patients to give them a different model of how uh, what's going on with their pain, for example. We do some emotional disclosure. I'm going to come back to that in a second. But the, the model that we give basically says, your pain once may have started as an injury, right? But over the course of the months and years, the control of that pain has moved from damaged tissue, for most people, up to a brain that has learned it. And that is, maybe through conditioning and other processes, is able to sort of have more control over that pain. Then we engage them in emotional disclosure, come back to that. A little more time will spend on experiential enactments. Then finally, working on honest and direct communication in the real world. This is sort of the guts of the therapy we're using. Um, the emotional disclosure part, we basically ask patients to put into language any unresolved stressors, conflicts, or secrets they have. It goes something like this. Caroline, do you mind just telling me the deepest secret that you have? Let's just do it. We just let it go. <laughs> The eyes went like this. I, I, but truth is, it's interesting for those of us who've done counseling on either side of the thing, people negotiate how long they're going to wait before they reveal something important. What we found is that you, if you ask them in a supportive way really early on, people will actually cough it up and talk about the difficult things. We've been doing studies where there's a single session with patients at the physician's office, for example, and we ask them to go through their life history, including all of the bad stuff. 
the stuff they don't want to talk about, the stuff that they're afraid to share because they just, just met us. It's amazing what they will be able to share if you're encouraged to do so. So we encourage them to put into language in sessions, a therapist or it's a group therapy thing. Sometimes we ask them to do expressive writing at home, for example, like free writing, just let it flow. Or my favorite one, write a letter that's unsent to that person in your life who's been a source of difficulty, a source of conflict or struggle. Yeah. The unsent letter. And sometimes I'll have patients bring these things back in and use them in the next session. Maybe read that letter aloud. Maybe enact out that letter. Not just read it, but actually put it into play. We've actually done a bunch of experimental studies of disclosure over the years here. This is a list of the 15 studies we've done here at Wayne State. By the way, these make great doctoral dissertations. Because you have a, you know, your researcher, your, your doctoral student, uh, finds a population of interests, recruits them, randomizes them to either write, for example, or maybe talk into a tape recorder some other way, disclose about their stresses and stressful experiences for a few times, a few sessions, versus a control condition that does something neutral, writes something neutral. And then you follow them up for a few months and see whether the process of disclosure, writing or sharing or verbalizing, leads to better outcomes. We've done a bunch of those studies. <coughs> we learned a few lessons about doing these sort of experiments that uh, it is a simple cost-effective technique. It doesn't include much therapist time, for example. It has some positive effects, but and, and very few or no negative effects. But these studies that we've done, these experiments, rarely pass the test of interocular trauma. Anybody here ever heard of that test? The test of interocular trauma? So it's kind of like you're looking at your output from your study, and you're looking at this mean, this mean, and it goes, wow, boom! It hits you right between the eyes. Look at what I got, oh my goodness, it's a great effect. That never happens. It doesn't pass the test of interocular trauma. Usually it's a test of squinting and struggling and you know, trying to figure out, did I find anything there? It's a small effect. This is this, in done in these randomized experimental trials. So are you talking in the language of D there? If I were talking D, I'd be speaking D, it'd be like, you know, 15 one hundredths of a standard deviation difference between the effects of writing about stuff versus control conditions, which is pretty small. I like to have big effects that jump off the page and smack you between the eyes like, got something. It doesn't happen much with this. So we've been thinking about what we need to do to go beyond this. We, I think people need more than just instructions to go write about stuff that's been traumatic. They might need a model that helps them make sense of it all. They, they actually, when you read what they've written, they often don't actually focus on their conflicts. They don't necessarily express their adaptive feelings. Sometimes they'll just talk about how life sucks and how much they hurt. Probably not healthy. Um, writing, by the way, is not the most powerful expression technique. It's sort of lower on the list of activating techniques. Verbalizing it, enacting it, confronting, those things is probably more powerful. Sharing with others might be needed. Most of these studies, you just kind of write it and it's private, it's anonymous. Um, and I think we often have to help people change actual relationships, not just write about stuff. So we decided that maybe we need to involve a therapist, and that's the direction we've been going. Um, this idea of doing an experiential enactment, I've been sort of playing around with Dr. Edwards here about this. We basically have a person recall a stressful relational experience, and uh, then try to find language often for their anger, and to imagine talking to the person in this empty chair, and maybe even doing it in the present tense. I don't want you to do this again. This was wrong. This is wrong. Don't you touch me. Take it back. Stop now. Okay. It can get pretty intense, by the way, especially if people have been victimized badly. There's a lot of rage that's there. So it can get graphic. It can get really quite powerful. But oftentimes, what they'll experience is a, is a shift from helpless depression to a sense of power and dominance. You can see people start to grow, start to sit up, and, you know. Um, they'll feel the energy starting to flow up here rather than just feeling defeated and scared. Oftentimes, however, it's not just anger, especially if we're talking about family members, there's other tender feelings there too, like love or sadness over a lost relationship. That needs to be given some expression too on the right hand side here. The goal is to end up experiencing, experiencing relief, work on self compassion if that's needed, and finally, if needed, and often is to start to do some real honest relational work in real relationship. We've done now about uh, these many trials, clinical trials, of emotional awareness and expression therapy in these different populations. I'm going to touch on just a couple of these. 
So these are, whereas the experiments on disclosure were just kind of go home and write, these are actually therapies that last anywhere from one session to eight sessions, sometimes as an individual patient, sometimes in a group. Sometimes we have different control conditions from nothing to a good comparison. It varies a lot in how we've done these. Um, but one of my doctoral students, Elise Talker, actually was interested in irritable bowel syndrome. You mentioned again, this in your intro. And these are patients who have a lot of emotional things going on, often on average they do. And they got three sessions of EAET versus three sections, sessions of relaxation training versus just waiting another group that got nothing. And sure enough, we followed them up 10 weeks later and uh, the EAET was better than the control on reducing their symptoms with the relaxation training in the middle. But both of them improved quality of life, actually. Question, so when did you guys actually come up with the, um, the, the session for the irritable bowel um, syndrome? syndrome? Because it's like, well, I know someone that has it, and I first thing I said was, especially if their parents is, maybe it's something like an emotional thing that stress or anything could be causing it. And first thing she was like, well, I talked to the doctor and the doctor was like, no. But I'm like, have y'all ever like really thought about it? Set that in, just really think, is there an emotional thing that's attached to that? Because a lot of diseases that people get, like heart diseases, things like that, I think it has a lot to do with like what's going on with their life, their surrounding and everything. Because when you're stressed, it has the tendency, it will break down your immune system. In certain conditions will, stress will affect them more. So irritable bowel syndrome is in that spectrum of conditions along with that Venn diagram. Mm -hmm. It really seems like it's a major driver of symptoms. It's not the only one, because there's interesting things about the gut and right. the uh, biome in the gut and stuff that does it too. They say that people who go through a trauma such as what, like with uh, hurricanes or any natural disaster, if they had any type of, they've proven medically that if, they, if the people that had any type of severe problems, you know, physical problems before, the, but they were dealing with it, they said that if they had to go through the worst trauma with, after the hurricane or whatever, the they said that they, that they almost couldn't bear the problem. Yeah, it, the, it, 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 it acerbated. exacerbates lots of health problems and diseases. So there's diseases where there's immune dysfunction or clotted arteries and a whole range of things that can be exacerbated or sometimes made worse. I'm really interested in that subset of conditions that it looks like the brain is the primary entity, and whatever is going on in the body is a secondary driving. You know? um, we could talk about another one that we just did recently. Uh, Mesa Ziadne went to Crittenden Hospital. It's up in Rochester. And there's a family medicine clinic there. And she took 75 patients who have medically unexplained symptoms. Lots of fatigue and bowel issues and pain, like, you know, where the physician said, I can't find in our lab test what might be going on here. These are pretty common in primary care, by the way. And she just did a single, one, hour and a half long interview in the clinic, in the exam room, with the patients, with the subset of them, randomly assigned. The other patients didn't get an interview. Six weeks later, those who got the interview were healthier than the control patients. And there's one big study that I'm really quite proud of, and I want to thank you for your tax dollars at work, because this is NIH funded. Um, we published this about a year and a half, two years ago now, and uh, it is a big trial, clinical trial, of fibromyalgia. And fibromyalgia is this widespread pain condition that has a lot of fatigue and achiness and some sleep disruptions and some difficulties with mood and a bunch of things. It's, it's mostly, more often women than men, in kind of middle age. You'll find some teenagers with it, more often than you have 40 to 50 year olds. And we actually got money to do a two-site study with the University of Michigan and us. Wayne State was the primary site. Yeah. University yeah. of Michigan was the secondary site. Just got to say because I'm insecure about those things. <laughs> um, and it was interesting. We actually um, had tested three different treatments. I'll cover that in a second. And it was allegiance control. I want to explain what that is. We gave eight sessions to groups of patients once per week. And then we followed them up six months later to see how they're doing. And allegiance is an interesting thing. If you ever find in, in the world of psychological treatments, this is true for education, it's true for sociology, it's true for a lot of things. If you're comparing this approach with that approach, you have to sort of balance, have equipoise. Is that, are you given a fair shot to both of them? Most of the time the answer is no. The investigators prefer one, align with one, or allegiance to one, and they give the other one second status, they don't put as much energy, they hope it doesn't work <laughs> compared to them. 
that's a problem. In this study, we were comparing the new emotional awareness expression stuff with standard cognitive behavioral therapy by one of the leaders in the field, Dave Williams, who's out in Ann Arbor, with a good control condition, education control condition. And we actually had different therapists who were committed about and knowledgeable to that particular thing, experts in it, led by experts in that particular therapy. In other words, each therapy got its own best go, best shot. We controlled for the idea that there might be differences in commitment or allegiance or whatever. I'm not going to go through what the therapies looked like. We had, you know, we had emotional awareness and expression therapy. We were touching that already. We did standard cognitive behavioral therapy, teaching them skills to manage various symptoms. And a nice piece on educating all about the brain and fibromyalgia, essentially. One of the questions that was asked is, um, and we got some warnings. The community of patients with fibromyalgia said, are you going to say that this has got emotional, this being driven by emotional stress issues? Some patients were like, that's not cool. So we had to wonder, are patients even going to participate in this if they're randomly assigned to this condition dealing with emotions? Or are they going to drop out and quit because they don't like it? So here's the dropout rate. If they attended six or more sessions of the therapies, you know, blue, the new therapy that we're testing, was as good as the education. CBT was actually slightly less. It wasn't significantly less, but it was the number of patients. Attended. So actually, our therapy wasn't driving people away. That's nice to know. Here's a, a core outcome. What percentage of the patients said six months later that they improved much or very much compared to only a little improvement or no change or got worse? Mm -hmm. You see the difference here. Over a third of the patients got the new things that I'm much or very much better, which was better than the controls and CBT in the middle. On the left, what percent of the patients had at least a 50% reduction in the pain, which is a lot, by the way. 50% reduction is pretty much. It was significantly better for the new thing than CBT. I won't go through the other findings. This is a measure of widespread pain. How many parts of their body were in pain? The blue line decreased significantly compared to the other two conditions. So these patients were saying, my pain is less, it's less widespread. More of us are feeling a meaningful reduction in pain. I'll skip over this piece here. So what have we learned? Um, many patients who have these centralized pain problems do have unresolved trauma and relationship problems and conflicts. And that if they can do work on experiencing and expressing their healthy or avoided emotions, the adaptive emotions, the anger, the sadness, the joy if need be, the self-compassion, love, that you can get some really substantial symptom changes. There are some patients who change a lot. And you can do this work pretty rapidly. You don't need to have long-term therapy laying on a couch for months or years. But I have to be honest, some patients, you know, our numbers showed that there were a lot of patients who didn't have responses, right? You have to think about that. There's a few patients who are not ready for it. They're not open, they're sort of defensive, they're too easily overwhelmed. Um, so we need to examine you know, what predicts who's gonna benefit from this treatment and who might need something else. It's also, by the way, this sort of work, can you imagine how hard it is for patients to do this sort of emotionally activating work, to be asked to face that thing that haunts, haunted them for years, to replay it out, to tackle it and approach it, to express those feelings out loud including anger, really. Imagine how hard that is for patients. As I've listened to these sessions, these are the things that I've heard. You can imagine patients saying those things, sort of saying, I don't know that I want to go there, right? I'm sorry, I said patients. My, my error. These were all said by therapists. <laughs> Let me revisit this list. These are all said by therapists, the ones that I've been trying to train, the ones that I work with from the community. As we talk about doing this emotionally powerful work, this is what they say. That's why I sometimes say that this work leads to two people in a room colluding with each other to both avoid it. Regularly dressed, but just a patient feeling this way, you wouldn't think a therapist would be saying these things because it's your job to try to help a person get through whatever it is that they're going through. I see strength in you. I see strength. You might be one of these who could do this sort of work, but there's a lot who are very sensitive to the feelings of the other and don't want to settle them. Most of us caring humans are that way. Well, sometimes they don't want to risk losing the patient because of the 
monetary. Uh, could be yeah. that, or just the embarrassment and shame, or the, the sense of I've lost somebody and I, I can't help them anymore. So they, yeah, they'll say, I don't want to, I don't want to. It's, but there's actually two people that sort of do this negotiation. It's, it's unfortunate, but I see it a lot, and that's part of my mission, is to help training folks in clinical settings okay. to learn how to actually handle difficult emotional experiences without getting scared. Because if a clinician is scared, then that's not going to help the patient who's also no. scared. Right? Uh, uh, the idea that patient, that therapists are people too, too that take the whole notion that it's a human response to a human situation. Yeah. And so it's natural for people, regardless of they are dealing through a typical trauma, because they're sharing it together. It is a shared, shared experience, and it's, it's unsettling for multiple people. Joe, you had huh? I was going to say that uh, there's, although these, these are therapists talking, I think it's also true that patients probably, or oh, for clients, sure. for sure. have this. I have a, a friend who I've try, been trying for years to get her, she's a fibromyalgia patient, trying for years to get her to you know, explore some therapy. It's scary stuff. And even once you say, no, there's something wrong with my body, it's not up here, they're often running away from something yeah. up here. Yeah. Let me wrap this up by uh, suggesting this thing. <laughs> You know, as we think about interventions, and this is true for whatever your field is when you're thinking interventions, we're doing this sort of balancing act between non-maleficence, like doing no harm, and beneficence. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing those words right. I need somebody from English. But you know, we're doing this interesting balancing act. And we know, don't we, that there's this sort of uh, idea that first we should do no, harm. do no harm. Except it actually is not true for psychologists. Here's what the number one principle of our psychological ethics is. Number, letter A, psychologists strive to benefit those with whom they work and take care to do no harm. So if we were to change this from first do no harm, something Hippocrates might have said, what would we change it for? What would we change it to first? First, strive to benefit, strive to benefit while minimizing harm. That's a different take. Because if we operate out of, what if I harm? What if I harm? If my number one priority is no harm, that leads to inaction. It leads to doing nothing. It leads to playing it super safe. And what we end up having is people who are left suffering, like Joe's friend, left suffering for many years because people said, I don't want to unsettle things. It might be harmful, I better not. There you go, folks. That's my thoughts for the day. Any additional questions? Back there. Can you sign my notes for me? Yeah. Anybody teach you how to sign my own for you? I can do that. I can do that. Yeah. No, I, I have a question. You mentioned that this is for physical pain. But what about, a, I'm thinking of chronic condition. Like, I saw, you said, I. I have a friend who has sleep apnea. He talks about it all the time to me. I listen, you know, okay. But I got a feeling that he's not, the doctors aren't giving him any help. He doesn't feel he's getting any results. But he talks about it all the time. So it got me to thinking that him talking about it made me feel better. So I listen. But in, in reality, if it's a chronic condition, I mean, is this the same kind of thing you're talking about? Physical pain versus the chronic condition? Are there two different situations? Well, I mean, the term chronic pain is the most commonly used term out there. And defined as it's been around for at least three months and the healing has happened is going to have happened. Many of the patients, of course, have long standing chronic pain, right? It's been around for months, years, et cetera. I am sort of challenging the idea that everybody with chronic pain is chronic. There's a subset of those people where the brain is more involved and it's perhaps changeable. There are people who have chronic pain, and you know, the, there's nerve impingement, there's other sort of inflammatory processes in the body that probably are driving pain in an ongoing way, and we won't be able to, I won't be able to do much about it. A surgeon might. Um, but I do want to challenge the idea of chronicity. And then somebody who's got apnea, that's a different story altogether, because there's you know, some tissue issues going on. And but, but there's usually an emotional component to that, and you might have discovered it with your friend who's lonely, needing support. Was anybody else? Uh, oh. 
Oh, oh, sure. oh, I was wondering if um, you, your team and you have also developed like training for therapists who may feel like they need additional support to yeah. kind of go there with their patients. Yeah, right on. It's, uh, it's something I think about. We actually do a colleague, Howard Schubiner, who's my colleague at Providence Hospital. We do a lot of work together. We have trainings every year for mm -hmm. clinicians. We're just developing a five-day intensive one for this coming March. But there's a lot of interest around the nation and some around the world. Uh, I've got probably a half a dozen colleagues who are starting to test this around various places. Uh, as a follow-up, are you are you familiar with the application called Curable? And I was wondering to what extent. I like it. Be related um, to what you do. It is actually Howard and I. Have, Howard is actually one of the co-creators or at least contributors to that, and I've also given a few ideas to the Curable folks. So I like Curable. Yeah, what is it? It's an yeah. app that it's goes through a number of emotion-related things. Right. Um, it does uh, encourage written expressive therapy, and then it'll give you writing prompts. But it also uh, provides education about the you know kind of the responsibility of the brain and in pain in pain that may not be any longer related to tissue damage. Yeah. Joe, uh, how do you see the relationship between what you're doing and uh, mindfulness? And what? Mindfulness. Mindfulness. I, uh, I, I, I see mindfulness as a piece. Well, first off, I, I will tell you I'm a little cynical about the rage uh, of mindfulness going on in the field right now. Um, but there's a fast, there's got to be some weird zeitgeist thing going on. Actually, I actually suggest, I will toss as a side two pieces. CBT has lost, has lost its luster. It's been around for about 40 years and it's sort of not exciting anymore. It's being replaced by third wave approaches, which include the acceptance and mindfulness-based approaches. Those are just ramping up. And I think there's, in our, us humans, a need to have something we hold on to and worship value. And right now, it's the sort of acceptance mindfulness approaches. I also suspect that in the absence of the decline of traditional religions, another religious sort of thing has increased, which is borrowed from the East. You know, the Buddhist perspectives and the mindfulness that goes along with it. Um, so I'm a little cynical. Maybe I'm just jealous because it's getting all the press. <laughs> However, I, I have a feeling that um, it's, if you were to add to mindfulness approaches for chronic pain, the idea that this is actually controlled by the brain, and that as you do the mindfulness work, you'll see that your brain is up and down in regular right experience. As you tackle emotional things that come to you through mindfulness, you'll find that your symptomatic experience changes. That could be very powerful in sort of shifting people um, from just uh, could actually changing pain. So I think if you added some pain neuroscience education on top of mindfulness, you'd get more effect. And I also wonder about whether emotional work that's just done in a meditative state is powerful enough to resolve the traumas of some people in the context. I suspect not. I suspect they have to do more powerful work maybe with another person or out loud or in real relationships. But for a lot of folks who are less damaged, less conflicted, less traumatized, I suspect that mindfulness is a great tool to sort of help center and reduce arousal and improve focus. I think that's, um, that's, I find that to be true because one thing I've noticed like with, I'll just say like with the death of my grandmother because me and my children were so close and it's like um, my twins were the ones that was taking it the hardest. So one thing that I've, um, done with them is I let them I let them write her a letter right before the funeral and um, I found when they wrote her that letter and they put it in her casket they were fine they were like literally fine afterwards and they were like well I needed that yeah I believe so the power of making the unspoken spoken or the unexpressed expressed I do think there's a lot of power here. Good job as a mom covering that. I think I'm going to wrap it up today. Good to have you all here. Thank you.